So, yeah, so we've been looking at the White Lotus Sutra over the last few weeks. I think this might be the last in that series of talks on the White Lotus Sutra. And uh, I'm going to talk this evening about Pure Lands in relation, well, in, in relation to the White Lotus Sutra, but just in general, uh, Pure Lands and the Pure Land tradition. Um, but I'm going to start by sharing with you something that happened to me uh, when I was about 19 or 20, um, which was quite important in me becoming a Buddhist, actually, in the long term. And it was uh, a lecture at my university. I did a business degree at uh, Newcastle University. And I didn't really get that much from the, the degree, to be honest. But one thing I did get was, um, and that has been useful later in life, was this particular lecture that I went to. Uh, it was a lecture on organisational behaviour, which is usually very dull, but this one was quite interesting. And it was about ideas as prisons and organisations as ideas that could be prisons. And the lecturer said something to me that really kind of made me stand up and listen and has stayed with me since. And what he said was that um, you, you're, well, basically you're not in a lecture theatre. You think you're in a lecture theatre, but you're not in a lecture theatre. And you think you're listening to a lecture, but you're not. And you think you're a student, but you're not. And uh, basically these are all just ideas and you're behaving as if you're a student. And you're behaving as if you're in a lecture, but they're just, they're ideas. And... He basically um, he explained how we can become imprisoned and limited by our ideas. And um, yeah, when I heard this, it just like a, a light bulb seemed to go on. I thought, that's, that just seems really, really important. That um, yeah, our minds are so powerful, we can have ideas and behave, I don't know, as, as if that we, we behave in a way that, that our ideas are all there is. Um, and, but they're just ideas. It's, you know, just, it just seemed to really ring true that there's... In a way, we can be imprisoned. We can be imprisoned by our ideas, and they can limit how we behave. If you just got an idea that we're such a certain kind of person, or we can just behave in a certain kind of way, and the idea is just limiting us, it's imprisoning us. So our minds are, are very, very powerful, um, and the, yeah, the mind, well, our state of mind creates our experience of the world. And we've been before we started this series on the White Lotus Sutra, we were looking at the wheel of life, and we saw how different <coughs> states of mind actually manifest as different realms. We, we almost experience different realms uh, depending on the state of mind that we in. So our mind is really, really powerful. And that's a theme that I'm going to revisit during this talk, that our mind creates the world that we experience. Um, so yeah, so we, well, I don't know about you, but I can, well, I can speak for me at least and say, well, I've got um, quite a, a repetitive, reactive, unimaginative mind, um, which creates the same kind of world over and over again, quite a, a limited, um, not always that pleasant kind of world actually, I've got them kind of quite a, you could call it a, a, a calculating small mind, almost a selfish mind. So I don't know about the rest of you, but that's often what my mind is like and the kind of world that I can create. create. Um, but what, we, uh, yeah, what we're told as Buddhists is that something more is possible and a different, you know, it's possible to have a different kind of mind and to inhabit a completely different kind of realm. Um, but it could be quite difficult, it is quite difficult to imagine what that might be like. What might it be like to be a Buddha, to have an awakened mind? What kind of realm might we inhabit, might we dwell in? And the Mahayana Sutras, I've got written down, White Lotus Sutra and Mahayana over there. And the Mahayana Sutras are kind of, um, yeah, the, the sutras that give us a bit of a, a flavour, you could say, a bit of a taste of the world of an enlightened being, the mind of an enlightened being the kind of realm, the space that they inhabit. And um, it's usually the, yeah, quite an unusual, quite a, you could say, well, a, a cosmic kind of world, an unusual kind of world. These sutras um, sometimes described as being like science fiction, Buddhist cosmic science fiction. Because all kinds of crazy, uh, unusual things happen. So there's a, some examples that we've been studying in the Centre Team, the Vimalakirti and the Desha Sutra, which is a sutra, which is a Mahayana Sutra. And in that sutra there's a, a guy called Vimalakirti and he's in this house and all of a sudden the walls of his house just disappear, they completely disappear and um, yeah, basically loads and loads of Buddhas from infinite numbers of universes and infinite numbers of Bodhisattvas come into his house and uh, occupy his house. So um, it's not the kind of thing you often get in a regular kind of Pali sutra, quite an unusual thing to happen. Yeah, and, um, Paul, there's a guy called Shariputra, one of the Buddha's disciples, and in the sutra he, he becomes really concerned where all these people are going to sit, where all these infinite numbers of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are going to sit. 
and it, but it's okay because the Buddha manifests an infinite number of phones when we're also sitting. Uh, but somehow they all manage to occupy this really small space. And for me that gives a flavour of the mind of an enlightened being which just has those walls taken down, all those kind of limits removed, and the kind of realm. It gives, yeah, the Mahayana Sutras give us a flavour, um, almost like an experience, if we enter into them imaginatively, of what that kind of mind might be like, what that kind of space might be like. Uh, and so the White Lotus Sutra is also a Mahayana Sutra, and it's also got some quite cosmic episodes and quite uh, weird and colourful, unusual things happen in the White Lotus Sutra. And, uh, and again, also, it, it creates, yeah, it kind of gives us a flavour of what the mind and the, the realm that a Buddha occupies might be like. So we went a couple of years ago, well, the White Lotus Sutra starts off in a real place. It starts off in a place called Vulture's Peak. Uh, in somewhere in India. We went there, but my geography is not very good, so it's somewhere in India, and we went there a few years ago. So just, um, it's the cursor. Yes, I know, I don't know how to stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I've broken your flow there. Okay, I'm just going to press the cursor, excuse me. <laughs> so that should be this sorry, one. I, I That's don't know quite right. No, uh, you need to get rid of that. Let's try that one. There we go. There we go. Okay. So this is Vulture's Peak. <laughs> This is Vulture's Peak, that's another bank of Mani Dharma on Vulture's Peak. And actually, my, my, this is, so just to compare kind of my experience first of all of what Vulture's Peak like from my mind and how I experienced it. Basically, um, yeah, some rocks and some wood. And uh, quite, a nice view, quite a nice view, there was a nice view over the hill the that day. But um, basically, a regular hillside. So the next slide is, this is, this is, I've got this in because I have this on my shrine, this is me and the Mogul Banks at the top of Vulture's Peak, so I have this on my shrine. And then the next one is, is the people on a pilgrimage performing a puja on the top of Vulture's Peak. So the, this is the White Lotus Sutra starts with a similar scene to this, it's not people from Sheffield Buddha Centre, but it's the Buddha and his disciples, and they're gathered on the top of Vulture's Peak. So, and it begins like most normal um, historical Pali Canon Sutras might, might begin. But something unusual happens, Vidanya mentioned some of the things that happened and what, uh, in his talk, and one, something unusual happens um, right at the start of the White Lotus Sutra, um, a beam of light comes out of the, the centre of the Buddha's head and illuminates an infinite number of world systems and universes. And, uh, and the people seated on Vulture's Peak can see an infinite number of universes and an infinite number of Buddhas. Each universe has got a Buddha teaching the people uh, in that particular universe. And um, I think what happens next is, yes, lots of those, again, like the Vimla Kirti in the desk, lots of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas visit uh, Vulture's Peak. I'm pretty sure that, that's what happens. So it gets quite crowded. And we've got a picture. A Vulture's Peak is often quite crowded. That's, this is when we went to Vulture's Peak. And there were some Burmese monks, and the next one as well is some uh, Sri Lankan lay people. So it's, it was quite a crowded place, but if you can imagine, well, it's, it's, it's impossible to imagine an infinite number of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas all on Vulture's Peak. Um, so, again, yeah, we get a, a picture of the Buddha actually in probably a different dimension to what we're in, a completely different space, a completely different state of mind, um, to the, the kind of mind that I inhabited and the vulture speak that I saw. It kind of paints a very different kind of picture of the Buddha's in a very different space. Um, yeah, so, so we get, yeah, we get a flavour of the Buddha's mind which is completely unlimited and, and vast and in a completely different dimension. And an idea which crops up in the uh, White Lotus Sutra and also in other uh, Mahayana Sutras is the idea of a pure land, which is what I'm going to talk a lot more about this evening. And um, yeah, the idea is that each of these Buddhas who is um, teaching in each of these universes creates almost like a field from their, their mind. Their mind creates a field which is called a Buddha field or sometimes a pure land which influences, has an effect on all the people, all the people in that, in that field, in that universe. Um, yeah, and those, those, well, yeah, I'm going to talk a bit more, I'm going to talk a bit more about, I'm, that's all I'm going to say about Pure Lands now, just to introduce the idea that the, that's what they are, there's, um, yeah, the mind of a Buddha which is just influencing the people gathered in, around that sphere. Um, and I'm, going to, I'm going to revisit that. But I just start, I thought, what, yeah, basically, they wanted to revisit this idea that our minds are very powerful and they create the realm. They create the realm that we, we live in. And um, yeah, there's a very important verse. It's the very first 
verse of the Dharmapada. And the Dharmapada is considered to be one of the earliest texts and you know, closest as we might get to the word of the Buddha. And the very opening verses, which are, you could say, the key verses of, of the Dharma, go like this, something like this. Experiences are preceded by mind, led by mind, and produced by mind. And if we speak or act with an impure mind, then suffering will follow, like the cartwheel follows the hoof of the ox. And then the next verse is, experiences are preceded by mind, led by mind, and produced by mind. If we speak or act with a pure mind, a skillful mind, then happiness will follow, like a shadow that never departs. So these, for me, the, you could say the whole of the Dharma is contained in these two verses, that our mind uh, precedes, leads and creates our experience. Our mind creates our whole experience. Uh, so what we do with our mind is very, very important. And the question arises for me, well, what, kind of, what kind of mind, what kind of state would produce um, a kind of blissful, happy realm? Because that's the kind of realm I want to live in, actually. I want to live in a, uh, an, a pleasant, a blissful, a happy realm. So what kind of state of mind will produce that? And I think there's a big clue in one of the Buddhist lists. Of, and there's a list of mental states called the Brahma Viharas. Uh, and they're sometimes called, translated, the heavenly abodes. So it's said that these, state, these four states of mind, which are metta, compassion, uh, equanimity, and sympathetic joy, these four states of mind, if we, if we occupy, if we have this state of mind, it's like living in heaven, right here and now. now. It's, it's a state of bliss. Um, so these are kind of states of selflessness, altruism. When we're moved out of our kind of cramped, narrow state, and we're moved into concern for other people, and that lifts us into a, actually a, yeah, a, a, a sphere of, you know, a realm, a realm of happiness. They're called heavenly abodes. Um, so let's have the next, the next image is an image of Amitabha. The Buddha Amitabha is a, an archetypal figure who is associated with the Brahma Viharas with compassion, metta, equanimity. And he's also associated with pure lands, which I'm going to talk a lot more about you know, shortly. Um, and there's, you could say there's a, a fifth Brahma Vihara, it's not, I've, I've made this up, it's not, it's not kind of part of the official list of Brahma Viharas, but the fifth, you could say the fifth Brahma Vihara is a mental state or a, an emotional state called Shraddha, which is again written on the, the flip chart over there, as is Amitabha. So Shraddha, um, well it, it, in a sense it hasn't got an English, a direct English translation. Um, but we have, it's often translated as faith, which can be a bit misleading, which I'll, exp I'll, go, I'll go to explore. Maybe a better translation is something like uh, confidence or trust. They're kind of, again, a bit clunky. They don't quite do justice to what Shraddha actually is. But there's a, a definition by Sangharakshita, which is that Shraddha is when what's highest in us resonates with what's highest in the universe. So what's highest in us resonates with what's highest in the universe. So it's, it's that experience of, of when metta, all the Brahma Viharas are uh, states based on metta, and when, when metta meets something else, they turn into a different state. So when metta meets suffering, it turns into compassion. And when metta meets someone else's success, it turns into sympathetic joy. Well, Shraddha is that experience when metta meets something awesome, something uh, higher than us, something that we revere. It's when Shraddha meets beauty or truth. So you might have had that experience maybe in nature perhaps when you've seen something really awe-inspiring or beautiful or maybe when you first encountered uh, an image of the Buddha or maybe when you first read or heard some verses of the Dharma and I, I, the first time yeah, the first time I encountered verses of the Dharma I had a, a resonance of this is true something in me resonated with it um, so Shraddha is when yeah, what's highest in us resonates with what's highest in the universe and again we are lifted out of our kind of small selfish concern with ourselves and we just kind of we are uh, lifted out of that into a space of kind of other other regarding a more altruistic space so Shraddha is when we encounter truth and, and resonate with our beauty so I've, I've introduced three um, three themes so far and I want to bring them all together so I've talked about how our mind makes realms how the, our state of mind creates the realm that we live in and I've talked about um, I've just briefly mentioned pure lands and Buddha fields in Mahayana Sutras. And I've also talked about Shraddha, this mental state which is crucial, a crucial mental state or emotional state of Shraddha. And all of these three areas are brought together 
um, and emphasize in a particular tradition, a tradition of Buddhism called the Pure Land Tradition, or Shin, Shin Buddhism is sometimes called. Um, and this approach, this whole tradition approach, is, well, I think, crystallized in a myth or a legend surrounding Amitabha, the Buddha Amitabha. So, just a very shortened version of it goes something like this. The, uh, these are kind of the, the headlines, the kind of short, you know, the, the summary of this, this myth. So, before Amitabha became a Buddha, this is kind of aeons and aeons ago, a very, very long time ago, so it's not measurable. It's beyond, it's, it's, it indicates, in a way, it's a, it's a mythical story. But before Amitabha was a Buddha, he was a, he was a human being, he was a bodhisattva in human form. He was someone who was trying to become enlightened, to help all beings. He was a bodhisattva. And um, he, made, he made a series of vows, it said. And one vow he made was that, if I become a Buddha, I'm going to create a, a Buddha field. That if anybody, um, yeah, if any, all, all somebody will have to do is have complete faith and trust in me, and they'll be reborn into this Buddha field, and they'll be guaranteed to awaken. So yeah, so he made this vow, if anybody, I'm, if I become a Buddha, I'm going to make the best Buddha field. And if anybody just has confidence and faith in me, they'll be reborn into this Buddha field, and they're guaranteed to awaken. Um, and that has become, basically, the, the emphasis, the basis for a whole tradition of Buddhism. They're called the Pure Land Tradition. And it's based on, um, you have faith or trust in Amitabha, and you'll be okay. You'll be, you'll be reborn into a Pure Land. You'll be saved. Um, so, yeah, if you're anything like me, that might set some alarm bells. You. you might be thinking, well, that sounds a little bit like Christianity. That sounds a little bit like um, God. Um, so a series of questions kind of come up in response to that for me. So I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you what they are, and then I'm going to give my answers to them. So the first question that comes up is, well, is this God? That's, what, that's the first question. It sounds a bit like God. The second one is, should we take this literally? Should we take this as literally true? Um, in what way? In what way will be will we be saved? In what way will will we be okay? In what way will we be saved? Uh, what kind of faith is this? Is this blind faith? What kind of faith are we asked to have in Amitabha? Um, you know, what do we? What, what is it that we can have faith in? And um, what what is what is it that Amitabha represents? So a whole series of questions throw up for me basically in, in response to this myth. But the first one is: Should we take this literally? And the answer is, well, no, well, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure we shouldn't, you know, particularly in our culture, we, um, it's not helpful to take that literally, to think that we can, um, yeah, I mean, for some, I guess in, in Pure Land traditions and in Asian countries in particular, that people will take this literally, I think. But for me, um, it's, it's a very powerful metaphor for something, and I want to kind of unpack what I think it's a, a metaphor for, what, how, we can, how we can make use of it, how we can approach this in kind of modern Western culture who might have rejected Christianity. Um, yeah. so what can we, how can we make, make say, uh, sense of this? So my, kind of the next question that throws up is, well, if we have, so according to the, the Pure Land tradition, if we have uh, faith in Amitabha, we'll be saved. So in what way might we be saved uh, according to the Pure Land tradition? Well, it doesn't, if we have faith in Amitabha, it's not going to stop us experiencing pain, and it's not going to stop us uh, from experiencing suffering. It's not going to help us to get a new job. Uh, it's not going to help our team win the FA Cup, unfortunately. Um, yeah, but we are, in, in our, we've got to be careful because in our society we're very powerfully influenced, well, even without meaning to, we're powerfully influenced by Christian thinking. And I certainly am. I was brought up as a Christian um, before I became a Buddhist. And I've had a, a re, yeah, my, re, my approach to Buddhism has been coloured by by this kind of Christian thinking, and um, yeah, I had a recent dose of this. The last few weeks, maybe yeah, maybe the last few weeks have been quite a bit of suffering, quite a bit of dukkha in my life, a bit more than usual. And my response to it has been, well, it's not fair. It's, this isn't fair. Um, basically, I've been practicing Buddhism, and I'm and I've been a good Buddhist. And the universe isn't being nice to me. The universe isn't being good to me, and it should be because I've been nice to the universe. I've been I've been a good Buddhist, so the universe should be good to me. And unfortunately, what I've um, discovered is that it doesn't work like that. Um, basically, the universe doesn't, um, there isn't, you know, Amitabha isn't a kind of figure sitting up somewhere in the clouds being good to me if I'm, if I'm a good boy, if I'm a good boy. So it doesn't work like that, unfortunately. So we're not going to be, 
yeah, we're not going to be saved in that way. We're not going to have what we want happen or avoid what we don't want. Okay, so what kind of what kind of faith um, might we have in Amitabha? What kind of faith might we have? Well, the kind of faith that I was used to in Christianity, and this might not be the same for all Christians, but when I was a Christian, I, was, I felt like I was asked to believe in something that I couldn't prove, I couldn't know to be true. It was a kind of a, what you might call a blind faith. I just had to kind of, what made me a Christian was I believed in certain things that I actually felt I couldn't believe in or I, didn't, I couldn't test if they were true. But what um, Sangha actually to describes Shraddha, which is what we translate as faith, what, what we, what we Sangharachita defines Shraddha as is, it's, um, it's based on intuition, it's based on our intuition, intuition uh, our kind of gut response, but it's grounded in reason, it's grounded by reason, and it's tested in our experience. So as Buddhists, we're not, and the Buddha was very clear about this, we're not asked to believe something that we can't test in our experience, that we can't prove to be true. Um, we're not asked to believe in something we can't, you know, we can't test out, we can't prove. So it's not, this isn't a blind faith. So again, this is something that differentiates, for me, Pure Land uh, Buddhism from Christianity. Um, yeah, so what, what can we have faith in? If it's, um, what are, in a sense, what, how, how can we make sense of this? What, if we can have faith in Amitabha, and we're going to be saved, what, what is it we're having faith in? Um, so for me, an immediate thing that I think, and my immediate response to this is if, Basically, we, we need to trust. Uh, well, we need to trust the law of karma. Actually, we need to trust the law of karma and the Buddhist practices. We need to have confidence in them because it comes back to what I was saying about our mind. Our mind is very, very powerful. What we do with our mind has real consequences. What we think, what we speak, how we act has very, very real consequences because what how we do basically how we think and speak and act shapes our mind. It shapes our states of mind. Um, and the Buddha came up with a, an image of a, a potter. Um, you know, just a, a pot of clay going around and being shaped by a potter. And it's like our, yeah, our actions now will shape our mind. They're going to shape who we become. They're going to shape our mind. And our mind creates our whole experience of the world. So our mind is very, very powerful. And um, yeah, well, the law of karma says well, basically how we act will shape our mind. If we act skillfully, um, our, mind, our mind will expand and will become more and more positive and we will experience happiness. If we, if we act unskillfully, well, our mind will contract, we'll experience suffering. So we need to take, yeah, basically our mind is very powerful. It creates our world. And yeah, as my lecturer said in my business degree, our, our mind can create a prison. Our state of mind can create a prison and that can create a lot of suffering. So we need to take this very, very ser seriously. And basically what we need to do is have complete confidence and trust in that, in the law of karma, that our, we can change our mind, we can shape our mind. How we act will change us, it will change our mind. Um, yeah, and basically if we don't, if we don't, if we don't trust the practices, they're not going to work. That's basically the whole culture. If we, if we approach meditation half-heartedly, if we do the metta bhavana, I think, well, you know, I've done the metta bhavana loads of time, it doesn't really work. It doesn't, the same thing happens over and over again, I can't really do it. But if you approach the metta bhavana with that attitude, it isn't going to work. It's, you know, the same thing will happen again. Um, we need to we need to approach meditation practices and all Buddhist practices with confidence. We need to approach them wholeheartedly. Um, yeah, because if we approach them half-heartedly, we, we won't get we won't get the they won't work in effect. The, the practices don't work if we or the, the the degree the extent to which they do work depends on our commitment to them, how wholeheartedly we can commit to them. Uh, and you might have experienced, I mean, some of you are quite new to meditation, some of you have been meditation, meditating for quite a lot longer. You might have experienced something called beginner's mind, where when you first start meditating, you're quite fresh and you haven't really got any expectations. You can have some quite um, concentrated, focused meditations, maybe some quite cosmic meditations. But, you know, after a few years, when you've got quite a lot of expectations and maybe you know, expectations about how the meditation is going to work, it stops having the same kind of effects. So... Yeah, basically, what I think we need to have, the first thing we need to have faith and trust and confidence in is the practices that we're given, which is uh, the practice of ethics, in particular the practice of ethics, that our actions have consequences, practices of meditation. Um, we need to have real trust and confidence in them, otherwise they're not going to work fully. We, if we, you know, we need to really believe them. I was on retreat with a friend 
a few weeks ago, maybe two or three weeks ago, and we were talking about this on a walk, and he was saying he's got complete confidence that if he doesn't put petrol in his car, it's not going to start, basically, it's not going to go anywhere. He's got complete confidence in that. But um, he, can't, he, he finds himself not able to have complete confidence in the law of karma and in meditation practice and ethics. He just doesn't, you know, he, he kind of, he just doesn't act as if it's true. He doesn't act as if his actions have consequences or if his meditation is going to really change his mind. In the future, if we really believe that wholeheartedly, we, we'd act quite differently to how we believe. And I thought that was quite um, um, perceptive of him, quite honest in a way. That, well, well, we've got no trouble accepting that we need to put petrol in our car for it to work. But, you know, I, I, for one, have trouble convincing myself I need to get out of bed to meditate or I need to be ethical. And that is going to really affect my state of mind, going to have consequences. So, yeah, it's basically this whole aspect of, of Buddhist practice is crucial. And you could call this uh, self-power, what I'm going to call this self-power, which is where we are working on our own mind and we're changing our mind. We are, you know, we're, we're, we are our own, um, our own, you could say our own agent. We are responsible for actions, we're taking responsibility for actions, we're committing to the law of karma, committing to meditation practices, and we're transforming our own state of mind. So you could call this, uh, I'm going to call it self-power, that we are, we are in control of our destiny, we're making it happen, we're changing our mind. So this is, this is a, a, a huge part of Buddhist practice, and I'll, and I'll say more about this later. Um, and you could say, well in fact this is probably a big part of a lot of our approach to practice in the West. That it's, it's, you know, I'm, I can do this, I can release myself from suffering, I can liberate myself and I can do these practices and I can transform my mind. But um, the question that arises, another question that arises for me, well how much control do we actually have? How much are we in control of what happens to us? And how much can we really control the world around us? Well certainly we can control our states of mind, we can have influence over them, we can control the conditions we put ourselves in. But if you take our body, our physical body, um, how much control have we got over it? The cells that make up our body, we're not in control of them. We, they, they just get on with their own stuff. Actually, I'm going to have to confess, I've borrowed this bit from the talk by Vidanya. I listened to the talk by Vidanya on the Guru Land. I've borrowed this bit. And other bits are borrowed from Matt the Guru as well. But this bit's borrowed from Vidanya. So how, mu how much are we in control of our bodies? You know, if you look at it, if we really break it down, our cells just do with their own stuff. Our organs get on with it. We don't have to, luckily, we are not in control of it. We don't have to tell our kidney to do whatever. I don't even know what my kidney does. So I don't, you know, luckily, I don't have to tell it to do whatever it does. It just does it. Uh, I've got a rough idea what my heart does. And I don't, luckily, I don't, have to, I don't have to remember to tell my heart to beat. I don't have to remember to tell, you know, to breathe. I just breathe. Just, my body just gets on and does it. So really, you know, this kind of sense, this illusion, well, I'm, I'm in control and I'm making it all happen, is an illusion, actually. Just, it's just doing it itself. And my body is just getting on and doing it, luckily. Um, and then also, physically, we are part of much bigger systems. We rely and we depend on yeah, much, much bigger systems within society, you know, for our food. I'm completely reliant. Basically, everything I got, everything I own, everything I've learned, I've got from other people. I'm completely, if I really honestly look at it, I'm completely dependent on everybody else in the world around me for everything that I've learned, everything I own, yeah, everything I eat, my house. I didn't build, I don't know how to build a house. My, every, everything I own and everything I enjoy, I'm, I'm, you know, I rely on other people for, I'm completely dependent on other people. And psychologically and spiritually, well, we're also conditioned by the world around us. We, we learn our ideas, our ways of thinking from our parents, our families, from you know, the culture of the world around us, our friends, what we read in the media. Basically, we're, we're conditioned psychologically and spiritually as well as physically. We, we're, we're not, we don't exist independently. So whilst our individual practice is crucial, and self-power is crucial, and we'll talk more about this in a while. It is crucial. It's not the end of the story, and it could be a bit harmful in a way. It could be a bit self-inflating to think, I'm going to do this all myself. I'm going to see through this fixed illusion of self all by myself. I'm going to see through my sense of self by myself. In a way, it's a bit of a paradox, and it could become a bit of an illusion, a bit, a bit, of, a, a bit of kind of self-inflation. It could become dangerous. Um, there's a quote from a new book by Sanger Actions called Living, well quite a new book called Living Wisely and I've not read it but I've, I've been given a photocopy of some pages and it looks really good so I'm going to read it. Um, and Sanger Actions says when he's talking about our sense of ego or our experience of ego, what he says is that um, it may be better to change the way we see ego rather than dismissing it, to be less as a thing 
and more as a way of functioning or a way of being. So he says expressions like trying to transcend the ego can create a lot of confusion. Um, he says you're functioning as an ego when you're closed in on yourself, when you shut yourself off from other people. But when you're more outward going and you're expansive on the other hand, when you're engaging with the concerns of others, well then you're functioning from non-ego. So um, to the extent that you think of others with genuine concern, you're non-egoistic. So, um, I really like that quote because it basically rather than trying to be trying to, you know, this um, yeah, ego is something, a sense of self is something that I'm trying to somehow get out of, some a thing that I'm trying to see through. Sangha actually says, well actually it's a way of functioning, it's a way of being. When we're selfish, when we're being selfish and concerned about ourselves, we're shut off from other people, then um, we're behaving in an ego way, in a kind of selfish way. And, um, yeah, so... What this, in a way, what this brings out to me, this whole kind of sense of me being dependent on other people and, um, yeah, selfishness and ego being a kind of selfish way of being, what it brings out for me is that well, the, 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 real, the real importance of collective practice, that collective practice is hugely important, that um, I'm dependent on other people, I'm dependent on other people for my spiritual practice and actually that's the way that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gain wisdom or insight into the way things are, is by operate in a less selfish way, in a more altruistic way. So collective practice, um, things like this where we're coming together in Sangha, building Sangha, is crucial. And you could, yeah, you could call this, I'm going to call this other power with a small o. Other power with a small o is when we're reliant on other people. Um, we're not kind of thinking, we've got a sense of, well, I'm, I can do it all on my own, I'm going to do it all on my own. Um, so we need to have, what, another thing we need to have trust and faith in, we need to have Shraddha and trust and faith in, is actually other people and the Sangha. We need to be uh, receptive to other people and open up to them. And this involves, yeah, it involves a practice of friendship. Um, and so, yeah, I had the picture of me and Amoga Banks up on Vultures Peak before. And one of the things that I experience of being around Amoga Banks is that um, it's almost like I can be taken out of my, yeah, my kind of you know, anxiety a lot of the time, my anxiety about how things are, my worry. And just I enter, I spend some time with the Banks and I enter into his space almost, into the realm that he occupies. I enter into more of a, uh, a calm, relaxed space, a more playful, happy space. So I'm kind of, yeah. If I if I just had to practice on my own in my own house, I wouldn't get very far actually. But by being able to spend time with people who are in a different space, a different state of mind, well, that influences me, and I can enter into a different space, a different state of mind. So it's particularly useful having friends like. To spend time with. Um, so yeah, so we need to be receptive to the people, open up to them, spend time with them, develop friendships with them. Um, but then as Sangha actually to was saying, well, altruistic activity, being um, unselfish is crucial. It's a crucial way of loosening our ego, loosening, um, well, yeah, ending our own suffering. Acting altruistically is a crucial part of this. And so the way we do this here in Sheffield at the Buddhist Centre is by building Sangha. We build a Sangha that other people can enter into. We, yeah, we try and create an atmosphere and yeah, just we try and create a, you could say a space, a realm that people can enter into and benefit from. And it's often um, striking when people first come to the Buddhist Centre, what they often comment on is the, um, I just had this moment of panic, that the slideshow vanished. What people, what people most um, comment on when they come to the Buddhist Centre is the, the warmth, the warmth of the atmosphere, the friendliness, the kind of positivity. It's almost like they're, they're entering into a certain atmosphere, a particular space, and that attracts people who want to come back. So for me, you could say that the Sheffield, well, I'm, I'm going to say the Sheffield Buddhist Centre is a pure land. What we, we're creating a pure land at this Buddhist Centre, very much a protective. You could describe it as a protective space, a protective mandala that we can create with other people and enter into, and yet other people can benefit. Other people can enter into. So I think that's a really important part of this that we we create uh, yeah we create collectively a pure land together. And one of the, there was an order member who said recently that she she works in an organisation where it's very very I don't know oppressive and you know she she can feel it's becoming more and more oppressive and it's a very difficult place to work in a very difficult environment to work in. But when she comes to the steps of the Buddhist Centre, it's like that all that all that melts away. And it all disappears, and it's like she's entering into a different space, a kind of a protected space or a pure land. So I, I think that's 
not to be underestimated, actually, that's a really, really important part of what we offer and what we're able to do at this Buddhist centre. Um, yeah. So I, think, I see that, you know, we've got self-power, which is where we really, really commit to the karma, the law of karma, we really commit to transforming our own mind and doing that. We, we need to take responsibility for that, we need to work on our own mind. But there's also, you know, what I could call other power, where we start to rely on other people, we start to rely on others and other people and recognise that and open up to other people. And when we start to do that, um, we're starting to loosen our selfish attitudes, we're starting to loosen our sense of ego and actually we're creating the conditions for something, something else, actually something much bigger to arise, something completely different to arise, um, which I'm going to call other power with a capital, with a bigger. Uh, you might be able to see this at the back, you might not be able to do it. I'm going to try and explain what this, this diagram represents. So, yeah, basically when we, when we use self-power, when, when we're acting skillfully, what we're doing is um, we're, open up, we're opening ourselves up. We're opening ourselves up to something much bigger that can arise. Um, so according to Buddhist tradition, there's been two and a half thousand years of Buddhist tradition. And according to Buddhist, the experience of Buddhist practitioners, there's been millions and millions of Buddhist practitioners over these two and a half thousand years. And what the tradition says and what these people have experienced is it's, it's as though uh, they get helped out. It's as though something helps them out. And um, you know, something can arise in certain conditions which helps us out. Um, yeah, you could now when we try and describe it, we can get into you know, a bit of awkwardness. So that's what I'm going to try and uh, try and do. <laughs> but um, basically, the universe is alive, and the universe wants us to wake up. The universe wants to help us to grow and to wake up. And um, well, that's certainly how I experience it. That's certainly how Buddhist tradition depicts it. And that's certainly the experience of millions and millions of people who actually commit to practicing it. What it, what it feels like is that the universe. Um, there's something, there's some aspect, there's some quality in the universe that you could say is leading us towards awakening, that wants us to wake up. And this is what you could call other power with a big O, with a capital O. And this is for me what's represented by Amitabha, the Buddha Amitabha in the Pure Land tradition. It represent, this is what Amitabha represents. This aspect of the universe, this compassionate activity, compassionate a aspect of the universe that wants us to wake up. And it actually, in, you know, it's influencing us right now, hopefully. Um, as we speak and as we're sitting in this Buddhist centre. So, yeah, I've written down, ah, I'm going to go to this point. Because isn't, isn't this the same as God? Isn't this the same as God? You know, this idea that there's a benevolent force active in the universe that's trying to help us to grow. Isn't that, is that not the same as God? Um, well, it isn't, it isn't well, well, maybe it depends on what you mean by God, but for me, um, as we're limited as, as, as human beings with our, for most of us a lot of the time we're limited and we, we, we fall between two extremes, two ways of trying to relate to this. Either is, one, one extreme is that we relate to figures like this as being like us, like human beings. You know, they're, they're, they exist like us as human beings, somewhere in the sky somewhere. And that's one extreme, that's one way of relating to you know, beings like Amitabha. And another way of relating to them is, well, they're make-believe. They, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very helpful myth, it's a legend, it's a bit of a fairy story, but it's make-believe, they don't really exist at all. And that's the other, the other extreme we can fall into, and often we'll be falling into one or the other. And it's very diff difficult to, to stay with that paradox of what, what are, if they're not like us and a human being and not living somewhere in the cloud somewhere, and they're not make-believe and don't exist at all, what are they? Um, well, I think a clue, a clue is given in Amitabha's name, Amitabha. Um, the arbor bit of Amitabha means light, um, and the quality of well, quality. If I think of light, the quality of light. Well, it's warm. Light is often warm, and it radiates. It radiates warmth around, and um, it illuminates darkness. Yeah. So it's another. It's a kind of um, or metaphor. It's a synonym for kind of wisdom and light. Light illuminates the darkness. It brings clarity. So the arbor bit of Amitabha for me um, denotes warmth and wisdom, which is kind of radiating. And the, the amit, amit bit, I can't remember the, the, the exact word of it, but it basically what it means 
is uh, immeasurable. It means it's beyond being able to be measured. It's sometimes called infinite or unlimited. But you could say it's outside of being able to be measured. So Amitabha, the name Amitabha means a light which is not able to be measured. So you get a sense of Amitabha not as being um, you know, a human being like a figure sitting up in the cloud somewhere, but as being something that's in the universe radiating warmth and compassion, an aspect of the universe which is radiating warmth and compassion. And that's, um, so you could say, well, the Dharma is alive. The Dharma isn't just a series of words in a book or a series of ideas or concepts. The Dharma is alive and it wants us to wake up. The Dharma wants us to wake up and it's actually um, influencing us and calling to us and it wants us to wake up. So it might, I mean, for some people this might um, be quite frightening or spooky or they might not like it and that's fine actually, you don't have to relate to it in this way at all. I find it helpful but for lots of people they won't find this helpful. And there's another way you can look at it, which is that we, have, we sometimes talk about Amitabha as representing our higher self. You know, it's, it's us as we could be, our higher self. And you might experience, well, sometimes it's as though we've got a higher self which is, which is trying to guide us towards... It's, it's, it's a part of us that knows the direction to go in, a part of us that knows what's going to be for our real good, what's going to be for our real benefit. And it's as though we can, we, you know, we can listen to that part of us, we can listen to our higher self and follow it, and follow its guidance, and be kind of led, you know, instinctively towards what's for our benefit, what's going to make us grow. So, you know, if, yeah, there's, um, well, if, if take going back to this definition of, if, it's, if Shraddha is what's highest in us, resonating with what's highest in the universe, well, for me, it doesn't really matter whether it's something in the universe resonating with us, outside of us, or something in, inside of us resonating with something out there. In a way, those kind of distinctions don't, ultimately don't matter. So you can think of it either way. You can think of it as your higher self or you can think of it as something outside, you know, an aspect of the universe which is trying to uh, influence and guide you. And either's fine, actually. Either way of thinking about it is, is fine. But for me, and for lots of people, it does feel like um, I'm being helped, I'm being helped out, actually. And, um, yeah. So um, it's as though there's a... Yeah, it's as though there's a, a voice, whether it's, it's for coming from outside and some, some aspect of the universe or it's coming from our higher self. It's as though there's like a voice that speaks to us, it's calling to us, and it speaks very, very quietly, very, very faintly. And it's often drowned out by all the noise of the busyness of the day-to-day -day stuff, what we've got to do, our shopping list, our work, you know, the things we want to get, the holidays we want to go on. So all the, you know, our, the, the voice of our higher self, which, which knows what's best for us, it's just drowned out, it gets drowned out by all this stuff. We have to learn to listen to it, we have to learn to be receptive to that part of us, or that part of the universe. And that's again the faculty of Shraddha, this aspect of Shraddha, this faculty that we can actually develop within us. It's the part of us that resonates with the truth and beauty, it resonates with what's ultimately going to be best for us. Um, so yeah, so now moving on to this uh, diagram. What on earth is this diagram about? Uh, I'll try to explain. So you could, you could also see um, the Dharma, or Amitabha, or what's highest in us. You could see it as though it's a force at work in the universe, or a stream, a stream of conditionality at work in the universe. And Sangha Rachel, in some of his earlier lectures, described, um, it says there's two forces at work in us. There's the force of the gravitational pull, he calls it, of our, uh, our conditioned self, our kind of selfish ways, our habits, our desire for status, our praise, the influence of society, our greed, our envy, our hatred. So there's a gravitational pull and it's pulling us towards me and mine and kind of our selfish desires and wants. And there's, it's, it's, there's low, it's like a gravitational pull and it's very, very strong indeed. And there's another force which is our Shraddha and the, the influence of the Dharma, the influence of what's highest in us. And it's very, very subtle and very, very faint and very, very weak. And it gets overpowered by the gravitational pull of the conditions of our selfish habits, our habits. So what we need to do, we need to be working through self-power, we need to work yeah, with the law of karma, we need to work with our states of mind, to become more expansive, to work, to function in ways that are altruistic, that are less and less selfish. We need to counteract this gravitational pull. Um, and we need to it's particularly cultivate Shraddha, we need to become open and receptive to what's highest in us and what's highest in the universe. And um, what we're doing is, in a way, we're setting up the conditions 
for something, you know, other power with a capital O to arise, whether it's our highest aspect of ourselves or something at work in the universe that wants us to awaken. We're setting up conditions for something else to arise. And uh, you can see it as uh, what we're doing is, is putting up a lightning conductor because we want lightning to strike. We need to set up the conditions where um, it's more favourable for us to be influenced by what's highest in us or what's highest, highest in the universe. Um, yeah, there's another quote from this Living Wisely which is very helpful in trying to illustrate this. So, Sangha actually says, as a result of this spiralling outwards of our being, our experience of ourself is no longer fixed, rigid and closed. You become so expansive, so engaged with and so interested in the needs of others that the possibility of going back to that old, constrained, self-regarding behaviour no longer exists. The process of your expansion has gathered so much momentum that it is now irreversible. It's not that you've somehow got rid of this thing called ego, this extra baggage you don't need, don't need anymore. It's simply the whole momentum of your being is so creative, so outward looking, that to behave selfishly, selfishly, I'll say it, selfishly has become impossible. So you become so outward looking that to behave selfishly has become impossible. So basically this is what's known. Um, there's various things actually, in different traditions, this is, this is a crucial point in our spiritual practice. We're working to work against this gravitational pull of the condition of our selfishness. And something actually very different arises. Something very different can happen. Um, so in some traditions it's called stream entry. In some traditions it's called the rising of the bodhicitta. And in the pure land tradition it's, it's called being reborn into a pure land. And um, basically, I, I think these are just all describing the same experience, a very crucial, very important experience on the Buddhist path, which is when, you know, the, the what we could call other power with a big O, becomes the most influential aspect in our lives. It's no longer me trying to, uh, yeah, trying to get enlightened, but actually I've just become, I've just started to cooperate, I've just started to become part of something much bigger. So in some traditions it's emphasised by seeing, you know, by insight and seeing through the state of self. So it's seen, I've, I've drawn an eye at the top and I said that equals wisdom and insight. In Mahayana traditions, um, this state is known more as the arising of the heart that wants to awaken for all beings, the bodhicitta, and it's, it's associated with compassion. So this state, it can be emphasised in a kind of heart way as, as compassion and bodhicitta, or in a wisdom way as insight. But if you were just, you know, going back to the fact that well, our states of mind can also be manifested as realms. But how might you manifest, how might you describe this state as a realm? Well, I think you describe it as being born into Amitabha's pure land, actually, where you're guaranteed to awaken. Because from this, from this actual point on the path, you're, guaranteed, you're irreversible, you're guaranteed to awaken. So if you're going to describe it as, as being born into a place, you describe it as being born into Amitabha's pure land. So, um, yeah, that's how I make sense of um, the myth of Amitabha, basically. What is, you know, what is Amitabha? Well, Amitabha is a force that I experience, actually, and other people experience helping me. Act, you know, I, this is how I like to interpret you know, uh, some, a force in the universe helping me. But you can experience, you can interpret that in different ways if you want to. Um, yeah. And being reborn into Amitabha's pure land is actually that state of mind when we're no longer concerned about our, our own welfare and state of being anymore. We, we want to awaken for all beings. <coughs> and then we're reborn in Amitabha's pure land. So that's a bit about the myth, and I just want to talk about well, how actually might this be useful in practice? How do I approach this? Because I actually, I, my practice, I took on an ordination as the Amitabha uh, <coughs> visualization practice, and I've, I've quite, you know, basically since I heard about Pure Land Buddhism, maybe when Matt Naguna and Vidanya talked about it five or six years ago, something like that, maybe a bit less than that, I, I've been really interested in this approach to, to Buddhism, this Pure Land approach. Um, so I just want to talk about well, why I find it useful and how know how I approach it. So when Ratnaguna came to Sheffield, and, he, and he's, he's, a, an ex, he's an order, I'm actually going to be given a day at the Sheffield Buddhist Centre on reflection in a few weekends, so come to that day because it'll be brilliant. But Ratnaguna gave a talk about the Pure Land, and he said, well, for his, his experience, and a lot of people, he's been practicing for kind of 20 or 30 years, and he said a lot of people have been practicing for a long time, they have an experience that goes a bit like this. So for example, if you imagine an enlightenment that wall over there, and you're going, you're travelling towards the enlightenment that wall over there, and you kind of reflect and you look back on how far you've got and how much progress you've made in those 20 or 30 years, and you've basically gone about this far. 
you know, if, if that you've made about that much progress in those 20 or 30 years. And when you start to do the maths and think, well, actually, I need some help, and I'm not going to be able to do it, I can't do this, I can't. And then as you practice more and more, you'll cover more and more habits, more and more of this kind of, these forces that are, you know, compelling, pushing you in this gravitational pull. We've just, we will cover more and more selfishness, more and more greed, more and more hatred. And you think, oh, man, how am I ever going to break through all of this? How am I going to get past this kind of, gravity, what feels like a gravitational pull? How am I ever going to do this? And, you know, actually it feels like you need help. You need help from something bigger, something outside of you. And, um, well, yeah, basically when you've committed to practice wholeheartedly for 30 years or longer, and then you realise you need help, well, um, that's the condition for actually something to, to start to help you. And it's sometimes said, it's like if we reach up, something else reaches down to us. And we can reach up and something in the universe might reach down to us. And that's kind of been the experience of a lot of practitioners. Um, and I think, I've not been following track of time, so I might have been talking for too long, but I've got a few, a few short things to just to, to round up. And one of them is a story of Avalokiteshvara, which I think really helps to illustrate how self-power and other power both work, how we need both. So, so have a look at Teshvara, there's a myth, another myth, um, another uh, archetypal figure called Avalokiteshvara, and he's also associated with compassion. And also in, in, in this myth, Avalokiteshvara starts off as a, a human being, a kind of um, budding bodhisattva. He, he really wants to change his mind, he really wants to work on himself, and he really wants to eradicate suffering. Not just for himself, but for all beings. He's kind of started, started to move towards expanding you know, his, his selfishness. He, he wants to. He wants to be altruistic. He wants to transform his mind for all beings to benefit. And so he really fully commits, as I was talking about earlier. He, Avalokiteshvara commits wholeheartedly, completely, and so much so he makes a vow, an unbreakable vow. He says, "I'm, I'm going to basically, I'm going to release all beings from suffering." That's actually quite a, an ambitious vow. <laughs> he, he commits to it wholeheartedly. He commits really fully to this and you know so he really commits to self-power and for a number of years the myth says Avalokiteshvara goes off into a cave and he meditates to try and eradicate suffering in the world and he's, he's really committed to it wholeheartedly but after a few years he comes out of his cave and he realises again a bit like Ratna Guru he's, he's gone you know, this far he's, he's, just, he's, he's just made a slight you know, a real slight dent in a big ocean of suffering and he, he actually despairs and he goes back on his vow and he, he, he realises he can't do this, I can't do this, this is too big a task, it's, it's a paradox, I've committed to doing it and I can't do it, it's too big, I can't do this. And in that moment, according to the myth, Avalokiteshvara shatters, um, and that, you know, there's a lot of symbolism in that which I've not got time to go into, but he shatters, his, you could say his whole, his whole sense of who he was shatters into lots and lots of tiny pieces. Who Avalokiteshvara was isn't the same anymore. And Avalokiteshvara, somehow in tiny, loads of tiny pieces, cries out for help. And he cries out to help to Amitabha, the Buddha of compassion. And it's said that Amitabha um, reaches down to help Avalokiteshvara. And he puts Avalokiteshvara back together, you know, like Humpty Dumpty, you could say. But he puts him back together with 11 heads and 1,000 pounds. So Avalokiteshvara now has become a bodhisattva. He's entered into, uh, well, a bodhicitta. So Avalokiteshvara holds the Bodhicitta as a jewel to his heart. Uh, Avalokiteshvara has become somebody completely different, something completely different has arisen. And, and Amitabha puts Avalokiteshvara back together with a thousand arms so he can respond to the suffering in whatever way is necessary. He can see with his eleven heads suffering in all directions. So for me, the myth of Avalokiteshvara has got a lot of symbolism in it. For, for me, one thing it illustrates is that self power and other power are both really, really important. We need both of them. We need to really, really commit to the practices wholeheartedly. We need to really um, commit to transforming our mind, transform, you know, working on ethics, um, working on our selfishness by becoming more altruistic, um, building in sangha. We need to re really, yeah, we need to, we need self, we need self power. But we also can't do it on our own. We need something outside of ourselves to, um, if we're going to transform. And I think it's also illustrated by the two parables we heard Vidanya talk about, the parable of the return journey and the hidden jewel, uh, the jewel that's sewn into the robe. So I'm not going to go over the stories again, but you can listen to those talks if you weren't here on the, on the website. But Vidanya told the story of the lost son, the return journey. So a son um, basically gets, um, well basically he, he, inherits, he inherits huge amounts of wealth 
from a rich king who turns out to be his father and the son didn't know this and the son basically has to do loads and loads of work he has to really work hard to get to a position where he's able to inherit all this money so yes basically that represent, represents us having to loads and loads of effort loads and loads of self-power we need to really work on ourselves and transform ourselves but at the same time the son is guided by the father all the time it's the father who's helping the son along even though he doesn't realize that's what's happening and the son doesn't realize he's going to make, you know, arrive with all this inheritance he's being led and guided by the father which represents other power and the same with the parable of the jewel that's thrown into the robe again you can listen to that in Bidania's talk if you want to um, but the guy who basically ends up becoming really rich again by having a jewel that he discovers in his robe that's been in there all along well he basically is dependent on the person who puts it there his friend his rich friend sews it the road into his jewel, his rich friend points it out to him and reminds him. So in both these stories you've got um, you know, you've got the self and you've got other you've got self power and other power. So what, what I want to really emphasize is that breakthrough, spiritual breakthrough, or the big spiritual breakthrough that we're kind of often looking at and diff emphasizing different traditions, maybe as being wisdom or insight or the rising of the bodhicitta or being reborn into a pure life. It comes, that kind of breakthrough comes through lots and lots of effort, wholehearted commit, commitment to karma, actually, to working with our own states of mind, our own ethics. Um, that, that's where it comes from, that, but also from um, receptivity to something outside of ourselves, whether it's, um, yeah, whether we see it as our higher self or an aspect of the universe that wants us to wake up. Um, how are we in for time? What time are you observing? It's just coming up half past two. Okay, so I'll round up. Um, round up shortly. So basically my, my approach to this is I really like Pure Life Buddhism. I mean, um, as soon as I heard about it, I really liked it. And basically, I'm quite confident, I, I mean, I, um, yeah, from various things that happened to me in the past, I'm quite confident that if I trust the universe, it will help me. And um, I'm just really convinced by this. I'm really confident that if I trust the universe, it will help me. Um, it won't help me to get a new job, it won't help me to win the FA Cup or the Premier League. But if I trust the universe, it, I, it'll help me to actually get what I really need to grow and to develop spiritually. I don't know how it works, I don't know what happens, um, but that seems to be what happens. Um, and in terms of it, these two extremes of, um, I talked about whether we interpret Amitabha or the, these other figures as being real beings or make-believe, I tend to veer towards them, you know, relating to them as real beings. I know it's not kind of... Um, doctrinally true or accurate, but it's just helpful for me. I find it more helpful to just kind of ask for help from something that you know might be a real being, and rather than something that's make believe it doesn't exist. It seems to be help me to commit more fully if I just relate to it as being a, a real being. And doctrinally, that's not accurate. It's not correct, but I just find that I find that's what tends to happen for me. Um, but what happens? Yeah, basically, if I you know I've got a connection with Amitabha, I meditate on Amitabha, I chant the Amitabha mantra. What tends to happen for me is that, um, well, if you if you live if you approach the world as being a, a universe that's trying to help you, that's a lot nicer universe to live in actually than one which is hostile and everyone's out to get you. If you live in a world which is actually benevolent and alive, magical and trying to help you, that's yeah, basically it's, it's, it leads to a lot less anxiety. Um, you know, I can just I can relax a lot more and just um, just be much more at ease with myself when I'm when I'm in you know, connection with that that way of thinking. It just helps me to think actually that it's a much, it's a much uh, less anxious way of living and thinking, yeah, everyone's out to get me and I just need to really protect myself. If I can have a sense of the universe, it's actually benevolent. Um, it's, a much, yeah, it's a much better for me universe to live in. Um, what happens to me when I do the practice sometimes, when I connect with Amitabha, sometimes when I chant the mantra, just a subtle shift in my perspective happens. And, you know, sometimes this happens where um, I just become more aware of beauty actually, I just become more and more aware of beauty around me, more and more, world, more, and more aware of the world of being a beautiful place, a magical place, a place that's alive. Um, yeah, sometimes it's just a very subtle shift that happens from doing the meditation, but it's, um, yeah, I begin to start to, to inhabit more and more of a, a magical, beautiful world where the, yeah, the universe might be trying to help me to wake up. So that's what seems to happen by me chant, you know, chanting the mantra of Amitabha, connecting with Amitabha. So for me, the Pure Land isn't a place that we go to. It's not a kind of physical place somewhere like a heaven that we go to. That's not how I, that's, that's for me, that's not what the Pure Land is. It's a state of mind. The Pure Land's a state of mind. It's a possibility that exists every single moment. Uh, so we can inhabit the Pure Land 
only if we commit ourselves fully to the practices, if we develop trust and confidence both in the practices and in other people, if we develop receptivity, receptivity to other people, and what's highest in us, what's highest in the universe. So the world, the world actually is a pure land. Um, it's full of beauty and it's full of potential, but we just don't see it that way. We don't see the magic and the beauty and the potential that's in the world, but that's how it is, we just don't see it. Um, we're trapped in our mind-made prisons, we're trapped in our own limited way of seeing the world, and you could see we're trapped in a prison. But the, the actual truth of it is the door to the prison is always unlocked. Uh, we, can always, we can always, at any moment, inhabit a beautiful, magical world. We just need to have trust and we just need to have faith.